Well, looks like I've managed to avoid the Koei Tecmo ninjas thus far, but they're not giving up. As a matter of fact, they've upped their threat with a combination of jail time and a fine of up to $250,000. Still, I'll continue my heinous crime of reviewing the Ninja Gaiden series, but please know I'm really sticking my neck out here for you guys. So last time, we looked at Ninja Gaiden 1 from 2004, a critical and commercial success when it came out, and I think it is still a certified banger, so it only makes sense that today, we're gonna find out about its sequel. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay, th that's a bit of a change of pace. Released in 2008 for the Xbox 360, Ninja Gaiden 2 is like its predecessor, only 10 times more chaotic and 10 times as bonkers. So much so, actually, that it exploits specific strengths of the 360 hardware, and that its port to the PlayStation 3 a year later, Ninja Gaiden Sigma 2, had to have parts of the gameplay toned down to work. That said, there are many design changes even beyond that, and in contrast to the Black and Sigma editions of the first title, all these alterations make for two radically different experiences. Rest assured though, we're covering both Ninja Gaiden 2 and Sigma 2 all the same, and just for clarity, Vanilla 2 has a gold UI at the top, while Sigma 2 has a silver one. To start with the basics, however, the mechanics are largely the same between both versions, and the core should be instantly familiar to you if you've played Game 1. The controls and many of the animations, from wall running to various attacks and combos, have carried over basically note for note and feel as excellent as ever, which is not to say changes haven't been made, quite the contrary actually. Overall gameplay speed is a bit faster, in a good way. Ryu's dodge roll is replaced by a quicker dash for example. Instead of casually walking through doors, he karate kicks right through them now. Climbing ropes and bars is sped up significantly, and that's much appreciated because it shows up more often here. You can adjust the rotation speed of the camera to your liking, which used to be a tad slow, and the visual and audio feedback for hitting and destroying enemies is some of the most cathartic shit ever. Team Ninja saw what the stronger hardware was capable of and took full advantage. The sheer pizzazz of effects and particles is next level. Just compare an ultimate technique charge from Ninja Gaiden 1 to now to get the picture for that and the gore is cranked up to 11 in Vanilla 2. Blood and other juices splatter all over the place there, dead bodies and innards remain on the floor for quite some time, all of which is reduced in Sigma 2, sadly. Whether this was an effort to censor the game or to optimize performance for the PS3, the lord knows really, but instead we get this dissipating mist which is fine enough, but the impact does feel a little lesser. What remains intact, however, is the new dismemberment system. In the first game, heads would sometimes fly off when any enemies die, entirely for flair really. But in the sequel, Ryu can also, I think at random, question mark, slice off their arms and legs. This obviously handicaps the opponent, but they'll continue to pose a threat. After all, you don't need arms to continue fighting, right? And dudes without legs may even crawl toward you in an attempt to suicide bomb on you. Some foes can even pick up body parts from their fallen allies and toss them at you. Everybody's out for the Dragon Ninja's fucking blood. Now, where the benefit for the player comes in is that you can instantly execute delimbed enemies, do a heavy attack when close to them, and Ryu will perform one of his many vicious obliteration techniques. These are simply brutal and one of the things that truly make you feel like an unstoppable murder machine, plowing through forces of evil with the staple swift yet slick camera cuts and zooms to add that final bit of bite. The importance of getting these details right in an action title cannot be understated and Team Ninja demonstrates a mastery of this craft. I don't want to think about the amount of work that must have gone into all the animation on display. Granted, a decent chunk of it is reused, <laughs> but there's also so much new. The returning ultimate techniques are the star of the show in this regard. They were already cool in the previous title, but man did they get an upgrade. They're unbelievably ridiculous and over the top, and each weapon of course gets its own unique variant or sometimes even two. Just check out this fully charged one for the true dragon sword. If that's not sick to you, then I don't know what is. Yep, we're still going. Okay, we're finally done. Unfortunately, for as impressive as the UTs are, they do get kind of old after a while. Essence charges have not been reworked at all from last time, so there's still the same issue of being able to chain them one after another, and since they are about twice as long on average now, repeating them too often can start feeling more like you're watching Ryu rather than playing him. To clarify, I love the concept of essence charging, I really do. But to me, UTs are supposed to be your ultra super moves. They should be balanced as such, to limit the possibility 
of or otherwise disincentivize constant spamming and to add real tension and consequence to the decision every time. There has to be a way to achieve that, right? And the sheer spectacle would also be all the sweeter and more earned if the UTs didn't happen so goddamn frequently. I'm somebody who will ignore or restrict use of resources and mechanics when I find doing so leads to a more enjoyable and challenging experience so I can manage somewhat, but there is the idea of path of least resistance and how many players will opt to take it. It is the designer's job to prevent there from being one as much as possible. It's a little frustrating, to be honest, because they've enhanced and expanded the combat in other areas beyond the aforementioned feedback and dismemberment. Nimpo is still unremarkable and detached from the rest. I mainly use it as a clutch attack of sorts or if there is so much shit I can't be bothered to deal with that I'll whip out a couple of devastating spells. And the Phoenix magic is the only one that can be used on the move, but it sucks anyway because you cannot damage enemies that just got hit by one of the birds. It's pretty lame, not gonna lie. However, Nimpo aside, there's plenty of positives to speak of. I never brought this up in my video on Ninja Gaiden 1 because it didn't bother me enough, but the bow handled kinda poorly there in first person, and 2 fixes this. The aiming sensitivity is nicer and tweakable, there's an actual reticle, and you can zoom in for greater accuracy. I found a bow somewhat more useful as a result. Sigma 2 even lets you move in third person while shooting arrows with a controllable lock-on. It's a bit rough, admittedly, but but welcome nevertheless. An optional manual hard lock-on for melee weapons and shurikens still isn't in either version, but more than ever you can seriously question if it would even be possible to keep up with. Occasional mishaps with the automated lose lock-on is probably the best they realistically could have done. I only ever felt the jank when tossing explosive shurikens from a distance or when trying to activate an obliteration technique, and in some ways it's less troublesome than before. One reason is that Ryu will do Flying Swallow regardless of enemy presence now now, so if you aren't quite on the mark, at least he will still carry it out instead of substituting it with some other shitty move. It's less annoying and allows you to get a better feel for what you're doing wrong and how to correct it. And proceeding down the list of improvements, Flying Swallow doesn't strike me as too unbalanced anymore, and similarly, I found that jumping off of walls is no longer as abusable. Now, the two haven't been nerfed, in fact, you can perform Flying Swallow a couple of times in a row here without touching the ground, but it's more that enemies generally seem better at dodging or countering these shenanigans, even on the standard warrior difficulty. I also inherently didn't feel as inclined and tempted to repeat these maneuvers ad nauseum, considering how versatile Ryu has become. Parrying, for instance, is something that was in Game 1, but I didn't utilize it a lot. For the sequel, I found it more intuitive to grasp the timing of thanks to this little animation they added. It's a small detail, but as such, countering enemy attacks is a technique I incorporated into my play loads more, and it can provide some additional new crowd control due to the way Ryu dashes around in response. It's just mighty satisfying when you start pulling it off with a big success rate, and the spin attack and by extension your launch parries can now even be continued into aerial moves, opening up the door for more combo strings. In general, this is an aspect where Ninja Gaiden 2 proves to be a sizable leap forward. I already complimented the weapons in the previous installment, and most of the worthwhile ones make their return, with a respectable increase in the number of combos to their name and how those can be chained into each other. I'm keen on the air juggling stuff they added to the Vigorian Flail in particular, and there's a lot of room to flex your combo muscles with the Dragon Sword and Dual Katanas, especially at level 4. Those things got a saucy pool of stuns to mess around with. Moreover, half of the selection is entirely new, and there's not one tool I don't like using. The advertised Wolverine Claws have a short range but are deadly and allow Ryu to slide around. The Tonfas have an even shorter range but extremely rapid attacks with exquisite physical punch. The Kurasigama has fairly slow wind-ups but hella range and can be used to pull enemies toward you, and the Scythe is essentially the slowest heavy-duty hitter. In total, that makes for eight reasonably distinct weapons with their own animations and repertoire of attacks, Gone are the copycats with two or three unique moves, and Sigma 2 even adds a ninth, which is the strongest by a mile and still relatively quick. Yeah, this blade is overpowered, which actually sets the tone for a lot about Sigma 2. Foreshadowing. <laughs> I'm gonna be a greedy bastard though and say I do wish the weapons were set apart further in a few places. Button inputs and their outcomes can feel samey here and there. Most have the fabled Izuna drop of course, and none of them sport any special, more unconventional properties like the Unlabored Flawlessness did, which would deal higher damage when you're low on health. 
I'd enjoy more of such features, and I'm also puzzled why switching weapons in the middle of gameplay remains absent. This was understandable for Ninja Gaiden 1, but with Devil May Cry 3 setting that standard in 2005, it is disappointing not to see it implemented here, as mid-combo swapping only could have elevated the variety and experimentation potential further. Still, it's hard to complain too much with such a wide arsenal at your fingertips, and at least the process of switching, as well as healing yourself and the like, has been streamlined slightly with a quick select menu on the D-pad. Well, it's hard to complain too much in Vanilla 2, that is. Sigma 2, on the other hand, makes a baffling detrimental change to the upgrade system. Rather than being able to level up your shit as much as you can afford, like in Vanilla 2, in Sigma 2, you can only level up one weapon of choice at a time for free at specific shops. This is just... Why? Why would you make upgrading so rigid? What happens in practice is that all your essence is spent on herbs and the like, making it effortless to drip feed yourself through the adventure wholesale, and you're denied out of combat intricacies you could have had access to by this point in Vanilla 2. As if to add insult to injury, you're arbitrarily not even allowed to bring any weapon to level 3 until you reach chapter 10 out of 17. I genuinely can't think of a single reason for any of this, what it's meant to achieve. Legit, I had everything maxed out basically as soon as I obtained the last weapon in Vanilla 2, whereas in Sigma 2, I still did not by the very end, despite being absolutely stacked in Yellow Essence. To be fair, they do dish out all the weapons to you a little sooner, which softens the blow, and both versions allow you to use everything fully upgraded anywhere after beating the game. In Vanilla 2, there's New Game Plus, which carries over all your equipment and items. The enemies and bosses aren't any stronger here, so the challenge is totally broken, but you've already conquered that difficulty to begin with, and it's simple, mindless fun as a power trip, as well as a way to more freely mess around with Ryu's arsenal. Sigma 2 has something even better, a chapter select where you can finally replay individual chapters as you see fit. It keeps track of your ranks per difficulty, yes, yes, and thankfully all the weapons are always maxed out too. Good shit, Ninja Gaiden is starting to catch up on this front. Now, if only the ranking system was made more robust and intricate, it still overly rewards performing ultimate techniques and now also the new obliteration techniques, so if you're gunning to achieve Master Ninja ranks across the board, then be ready to disregard like 80% of the wonderful combat in favor of doing the same actions over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It's, it's so dumb, I, I don't get it. Using recovery items and dying still doesn't penalize you at all either, so the whole thing falls flat to me. Sonic Adventure 2 got it right in 2001, and that's a dang platformer, LMAO. I really wish the ranking system was overhauled from the ground up, it would have added immense replay value, especially when you take into account Ninja Gaiden 2 is even more combat focused than its predecessor. This already reflects in something as simple as the music. The first title certainly has its energetic pieces, but there's also a lot of atmospheric and slower, more laid-back material in there, while the sequel does have its share of that too. The overall direction leans a bit more toward bombastic. As such, the soundtrack perhaps isn't as diversified and quite as melodically memorable, but it's certainly no generic orchestra that you cannot hum or won't want to pump outside of the game at all. In its own right, the score is really high-quality stuff, worthy of praise, and the instrumentation is magnificent. It hits a certain way and sounds hype as hell when you're embodying the Master Ninja himself, you know, whooping ass and surviving the other chaos that could end up swallowing you whole.
To further accommodate the shift, progression and level design has been simplified as well. You get a bunch of linear chapters that each take place somewhere else altogether, from not Moscow to New York City and from aboard the villain's large aircraft to the depths of hell, literally. To their credit, the environmental design is, for a good chunk of it anyway, pretty nice. Ninja Gaiden 1 has its neat locations like the monastery and Tyron itself, but for every one of those there would be something fairly uninspired like some underground catacomb or cavern. 2 isn't devoid of that, no, but among others you get a huge ancient castle to explore, a jungle far removed from civilization, and I think the renditions of various real-world cities are attractive. The Tokyo landscape that kickstarts the journey especially makes a striking first impression. You even revisit the secret ninja fortress and Hayabusa village, looking richer than before thanks to the more powerful hardware. The increase in scope and detail here over what was possible on the original Xbox shines through. Vanilla 2 and Sigma 2 are obviously closer to each other in visual fidelity than Black and Sigma 1 were, but I think Sigma 2 takes the cake again with a more colorful appearance, superior lighting, and a sharper image because of its native 720p resolution instead of whatever substandard pixel count the 360 version outputs. Outside of its painfully increased load times, Sigma 2 is kind of a technical marvel, to be honest. With this streamlined approach to progression and level design though, a hub with interconnected areas and the resulting backtracking is a thing of the past. This isn't inherently positive or negative, it's a pretty subjective preference, but I do miss this component somewhat. I thought it was handled well in the first title, and it paced out the adventure with stretches to recollect yourself from combat and break up the monotony. By themselves, the stages in Ninja Gaiden 2 have also ditched that Metroidvania-esque layout where you would collect items to open previously inaccessible parts of the stage. Don't misunderstand, there are still moments of downtime and nooks and crannies to look out for for upgrades and whatnot. There is exploration to be had, but the structure is more point A to point B. You can check out small diversions to the side, but you'll be back on the main path shortly. The absence of a map feature this time around sums it up really. Puzzles don't see a return at all, which, oh yeah, I'm extremely upset about, but platforming is utilized a little less as well, I want to say, and I was actually hoping they would tap into that more the second go-around. The clock tower climb in Submit or Die is probably the most extensive woohoo jumpy segment, and it's an awesome set piece. You can even lure enemies in between the two cogwheels, killing them instantly. However, in terms of actual complexity, it's nothing to really write home about. More consistently challenging and imaginative platforming is definitely something I would have liked to see, just to inject an extra spice of variety, but I should also highlight the way in which the level design has seen improvement. In Ninja Gaiden 1, combat encounters could only take place in their designated area. Enemies had to be fought where they spawn, as you would have to go through a door or something to move elsewhere, deloading the previous room. In 2, there are no rooms, if you will, and enemies are going to chase you down as far ahead or back as the stage allows. This adds a surprisingly cool layer of strategy to combat. If you're fighting a bunch of terribly aggressive ninjas in an open space, it might work better to return to that narrow cave you came from half a minute ago so they're grouped in a row and you can kill multiple with one string of attacks. If dragons in the sky are shooting fireballs at you while you're taking on already large dangerous enemies, it's probably a worthwhile idea to backtrack to the inside of the building where you can isolate the grounded enemies. If you're being bombarded by a stationary missile spamming dickhead in the middle of a battle, notice there is a bit of an angled wall here you can sneak behind to get out of harm's way and continue your battle with the rest, etc, etc. At the same time, the plan in your head could end up not working out too well in practice and actually lead to your demise. Especially if it involves proceeding further into the level, it's often a risky business because more foes are likely to join in and swarm you. The game doesn't fucking care either. Even if the engine has to slow down to a crawl to facilitate everything, it will not buckle down and you'll have to deal with every single enemy you've called upon yourself simultaneously. I gotta say, I commend that dedication, and overall I think this is a marked improvement over the level design of the first installment. I wish the combat and environmental hazards got more opportunities to interact with each other, like how you can shoot explosive barrels to blow up targets from afar in certain sections for example, but nevertheless I am pretty content with the level design, 
up to about the Temple of Sacrifice. The last third of the game or so is where the chapters gradually devolve more and more into corridors littered with enemies and little else. Much of the exploration and creativity fades away, and it makes the final hours kind of a slog I want to get done and over with. It approaches Final Hallway 13 territory. The combat mechanics are suitably expanded from one and the fact they managed to carry the endgame well speaks to how fleshed out they are, but in spite of that, Burnout is certainly a problem one can experience with either release of two. Not only is it a few hours longer on average and one was already quite lengthy, I'm also willing to bet you've defeated at least five times the number of enemies by the time the curtain closes, and that's an estimate based on Sigma 2. So, out of every facet where Sigma 2 tinkers the most is with the enemies. I recall many spots where straight up nobody shows up even though they do in Vanilla 2, and I'm not necessarily against that. Like I said, stages feeling like they overstay their welcome somewhat is a complaint that can be leveled at this game, so cutting down on the frequency of battles, especially ones similar in setup, can alleviate this. The issue, frankly, is that it sometimes leans too far in the other direction. The Tempered Greystone chapter is a fantastic example where there are long stretches of absolutely nothing to fight, and it leaves the level feeling eerily empty. Sigma 2 also removes any and all enemies and hazards you would run into on the water. For the combat, I get why it does so. You cannot defend yourself on the water, and Ryu's turning radius as he hops around is not the best, so it's pretty awkward fighting. The far superior approach in Vanilla 2 is always whipping out the water gun thing and tearing stuff to shreds, which literally boils down to button mashing. Not great. On the flip side, what I don't get is why Sigma 2 takes out the submerged mines, because attentive players can notice them and path themselves around them. I really don't see how they are cheap or problematic. End result though, certain unwatered portions are devoid of danger entirely in Sigma 2, so they, again, feel pointless and out of place. I think the most ideal solution here would have been if the water combat was improved, so that no cuts had to be made and you keep the variety in encounter design that it provides in Vanilla 2. That being said, by far the most impactful change in Sigma 2 is the decreased quantity of enemies in any given scenario. Now, from the research I've done, I gathered that the 360 is faster at rendering large polygon counts than the PS3, so part of this outcome can be attributed to that. Even on the 360, it's no secret particularly busy scenes will cause the game to physically run at a slower speed, which is charming in a few select set pieces, but an unwelcome stain on the action everywhere else. Dialing back for performance reasons on PS3 is valid, but nevertheless, I'm fairly convinced a lot of it is also artistically motivated. Sigma 2 is not shy about reducing the game's difficulty in more ways than we've already discussed. Enemy compositions tend to be altered. A section where you fight a handful of the same mini-bosses in a row in Vanilla 2, for example, example, might now only have a group of smaller, much less threatening fiends, and up to about 10 enemies or so seems like something the PS3 should be able to handle with sufficient stability. Whatever the cause and reasoning, more importantly, Ninja Gaiden 2's mechanics were designed with the large crowds of Vanilla 2 in mind, which is most evident with the obliteration technique. When you're severely outnumbered and trying to survive a massive scuffle, gaining the ability to instantly finish off an opponent is a small step toward getting the situation more under control. This doesn't translate to Sigma 2 that well, because when the game is inherently easier already, and you're up against less enemies as well, the OTs feel unbalanced and almost like a cheap shortcut to winning battles. The limbing is more inconsistent in Sigma 2 than OG2 as well, with big dragon monsters and other fiends typically losing a body part after a few slashes, whereas I recall regular human ninjas sometimes refusing to become vulnerable to OTs at all. What further widens that gap to compensate for the loss in numbers, enemies are buffed with much increased health pools, so those dudes with a low chance of getting dismembered, you can crush them into the pavement, jam a pole up their ass, squash their ball sack, they just don't give a shit. While that can make group fights harder, as probably intended, when they're by themselves it's obnoxious and ungratifying more than anything, and of course this is only exacerbated the further you climb up the difficulty settings ladder. 
Man, the, the higher difficulty modes. I am conflicted about these compared to what we saw in Black and Sigma 1, I tell ya. I should preface that I didn't play either version of 2 on Master Ninja. I was pretty full up after finishing both on Warrior and Mentor, sorry, but I can say Vanilla 2 and Sigma 2 have their own shortcomings based on Mentor alone. Ninja Gaiden 1 had such elegant difficulty modes because each successive one sported new and or enhanced enemies that were more aggressive and dangerous in their actual behavior. For the sequel, I don't recall much getting replaced, with the exception of the common Black Spider Ninja fellas. In Sigma 2, these replacements didn't give me noticeably more grief, honestly. What did really stand out to me, however, is the aforementioned health buffs all foes receive and the high amounts of damage you take. Grabs in particular can instantly eat away an astonishing chunk of energy. Especially in the early chapters with a relatively small bar, some attacks are on the edge of being one-hit KOs. So that's the kind of challenge you're signing up for with Sigma 2 Beyond Warrior. Certainly, I was greeted with the game over screen more frequently as a result, but I should let you know that I opted to use very minimal healing items for this playthrough. Had I not restricted myself, perhaps I still would not have died a single time, because all currency can be dumped into restorative items. Obviously, this doesn't apply to Vanilla 2 since it doesn't have that alien weapon upgrading system, and past that, Mentor in Vanilla 2 is infinitely tougher than in Sigma 2 to begin with. It's pretty transformative for the experience as a whole, if you ask me. There are more enemies on the whole, and as a collective, they are the most relentless I've ever seen them so far in a Ninja Gaiden title. I was fighting for my fucking life, so many battles you can think of, and it pushed the level design and mechanics in a way I hadn't seen before. It wasn't even until now that I thought to move forward or backward in stages to gain a tactical advantage, and nowhere did the obliteration technique make as much sense as here. They were only ever a relief and felt paramount to the balance of combat encounters. There was a profound sense of satisfaction in overcoming many sections, often by the skin of my teeth, However, Mentor in Vanilla 2 is sadly also where the game's uglier side is most blatantly exposed. The whole vision that makes the game so exhilarating and addicting at its finest, the die slower than your opponent's vision, is also its downfall for me at times. With such an unrestrained design approach, you're riding a thin line where things can easily tip over into feeling haphazard or unfair, and where that line is, is probably a very subjective matter and dependent on player tolerance and skill as well. Unfortunately, I did find Vanilla 2 crosses that line at various moments. Not nearly always, in fact, I don't really mind the much-hated rocket launcher soldiers, for example, because they usually remain stationary and are relatively easy to track otherwise. But whenever there is a million sticky explosive shurikens getting tossed onto you, or when the devs throw more of the kitchen sink at you than you can imagine, I kinda roll my eyes. Unless you're some NG god, it's practically impossible to engage with sometimes. That is, besides railroading yourself into abusing anything that grants invincibility frames and finding ways to stay in them as much as possible. I won't deny there can be a certain thrill to that in its own right, but that also equates to a major bias towards performing Izuna drops, obliteration techniques, and ultimate techniques, as well as spamming a bunch of Nimpo over everything else, and I've ranted about that enough. Another reality is that, with action as hardcore as this, the camera can also be a bitch and pushed beyond its limits. Off-screen ambushes, mainly projectile-based ones, can be incredibly toxic. Many attacks are so powerful they will crush right through your block now, so Ryu's defense isn't as helpful anymore, and neither are the audio cues for that matter. Focusing on and placing them is a demanding task when everything is asking for your attention already, and projectiles fire so mad fast that you cannot react to them if you hear them from larger distances at all. Banning off-screen attacks would dramatically change the game, so I'm not advocating for that, but I'm missing some kind of visual indicator that warns you of enemies winding up to ambush or shoot you, and from where. This would help considerably. Think of Bayonetta 2 and how it highlights the ground under you in such situations. Enemies and the scenery itself can also physically obstruct the camera, which isn't a new issue, but the more excessive nature of 2 only makes it worse. The big demons with their wings are especially guilty when it comes to this. This could have been mitigated somewhat by rendering objects in front of the camera transparent, allowing you to still see the enemy in question, as well as what's happening in your surroundings. I hate to bring up Devil May Cry again, but uh, remember how the pillars would go transparent when fighting Phantom? 
2001. Granted, actively babysitting NG2's camera with the recenter trigger and right analog stick, particularly with quicker turning speed configured, can alleviate some of the above, but that doesn't negate the fact Team Ninja should have done a better job minimizing blindsides and obscured views. So yeah, Mentor in Vanilla 2, best described as a roller coaster that brings out both the best and worst of the game. I'll repeat, the problems are inherent to the overall design, but they rear their ugly head on Mentor by far the most. Thanks to the more manageable difficulty of Warrior, I didn't find him to be as actively frustrating, you feel me? For the most part, Sigma 2 altogether is also on a bit of a different wavelength in this regard, and instead has its own unique issues I've already gone over. Out of the four playthroughs, if I had to pick one that felt the most well-rounded and balanced to me, it's Warrior in Vanilla 2, but in some, neither version quite displays the quality and finesse in their encounters on any difficulty that Ninja Gaiden 1 did. For as flawed as Ninja Gaiden 2 is, however, in reference to both releases, it's worth mentioning that it's actually surprisingly generous in some respects. It teaches the controls and mechanics way better than its predecessor, for one thing, with on-screen button prompts and optional video tutorials demonstrating techniques, and the revamped health system is quite forgiving. You see, with every hit you take, your bar will become increasingly more red on the right. When the current wave of enemies are defeated then, all of the bar that is grey up until the red will be refilled. This means you can get a decent amount of health back after overcoming a battle without resorting to any items, but you can of course use those to make more of the bar blue again, and save points now also fully heal you once when you first trigger them. Areas that you've cleared of foes will stay cleared forever too. There are no spots where enemies can respawn at all, unlike game 1, and so as far as the stage allows it, you can always travel back to a safe point to lock in any encounter progress you've booked before reaching the next safe point. Call these band-aid solutions for Vanilla 2, but I can muster up more goodwill toward a game where taking damage is an intended inevitability when it's appropriately lenient with health restores and checkpoints. Lastly, there's a pre-boss fight checkpoint now, allowing you to try again instantly after dying, although Vanilla 2 does not have a post-boss fight checkpoint, which is just cruel if it's intentional, or a shockingly glaring oversight if not. Thankfully, Sigma 2 does have a post-boss fight checkpoint, so thumbs up for that. Sigma 2 also has the courtesy of removing minions from boss battles on Warrior, with like one or two exceptions, and I approve of that. They show up a bit more again on Mentor, which, fuck, but it's nothing as crazy as in Vanilla 2. There, they appear pretty frequently even on Warrior difficulty, and on Mentor, it's off the damn hook. I suppose this falls in line with the rest of the game's mentality, but how they handle bosses with minions here leans toward the bullshit side of things for me. Not only are the bosses a lot more on the offense than in Ninja Gaiden 1, so are the enemies, and there are more of them. An intricate and complex encounter like a boss just does not gel too well with distractions or an ass load of explosive shurikens being thrown onto you, though there are tools available to make it somewhat more realistic and palatable. Stockpiling key and letting loose tons of Inferno Nimpo gets you far, and in Vanilla 2 you can actually toggle the camera's focus between loose and tracking the boss. Neither are ever ideal but you get at least some degree of control and flexibility, and it makes it sort of viable to take out minions first and then focus on the boss. A silver lining, if you will. That said, even without minions, the camera occasionally struggles to follow bosses correctly, notably when around edges of the arena. The snafu is usually fixed by refocusing a couple of times, yet those short intervals can mean life or death. Sidonius is a good example. I always use when he turns orange as a visual cue to jump out of the way of his incredibly strict crash down from midair, but if the camera at a given moment is aligned weirdly, he'll reach out of view as he launches himself, making it more difficult to dodge consistently. I will say, outside of that, Sidonius' fights are good and strong contenders for best in the game, as he's one of those that truly punishes mindlessly wailing on him. Slashing him during many of his attacks won't always cause him the flame enabling him to grab and beat you up badly, so you'll have to experiment and study closely what his safe punish windows are, where he will get stunned 100% of the time, and how long that stun lasts, and how much damage you can get in. Input even one button press too many by accident, and you may pay the price dearly. 
At first, he may seem erratically bullshit, but on his own, I think he is fair. I enjoy fighting Alexei for similar qualities. He has a lightning quick charge forward that'll grab you if it lands, and the fun of that attack is gauging if, in the moment, you should move out of the way altogether, or if you can predict where he will land and place a dash just close enough away where you can sneak in some hits. His moveset even expands halfway or so with the ability to charge forward successively in a row, and he will use this to be cheeky and fake you out. Suffice it to say, any boss that operates akin to the above, I probably liked. While I wish he were a bit more complex, Genshin to name one, and even the spider in the first chapter is cool. I was also on board for two of the boss fights that revolved around the bow. They aren't terribly deep, but I would argue more than the tank and helicopter in the previous title, and they create a different sort of dynamic and pace. The last one has a hint of spectacle to it too, as you periodically have to ascend the area. When used sparingly and done decently, I welcome these for the variety alone. Unfortunately, there's also a noticeable amount of weaker or straight-up horrible bosses in Ninja Gaiden 2. In the former camp, we have something like Volf, who's got promise since he blocks many of your attacks from the front, but once you've figured out how to get behind him, most of the challenge is gone. Elizabeth is mad tricky and has an attack that can absorb your health, which nobody else can do, and I think it's interesting. Surely she would be a solid fight, if not for how so many of my fucking hits would inexplicably refuse to register. Her hitbox seems broken, and it's kinda aggravating. Still, okay enough battles, but then we get to the bottom of the barrel. Gigadeth in the tunnel with these faces and his big face it summons that I seriously cannot figure out how to dodge reliably without abusing Nimpo. The Water Dragon, where you've only got this tiny pillar to maneuver, charge arrows and dodge a few attacks. And of course, the Tunnel Worm thing, where all you do is sit in one of these openings, charge a UT, and release when you hear the worm rushing in closer. These are simply awful, and combined with the minions nuisance, the full selection, just average out to a very mixed bag for me. Repeat bosses are common too. You face off against each of the four greater fiends twice, and while many of them do upgrade on the second go, Genshin is just inexcusable since you duel him four times, and only on the fourth go do I spot any differences. I would have been perfectly content with less bosses, you know. The worst is when they take the shitty armadillo guy and escalate it into this double armadillo hellhole later with atrocious visibility. It's dreadful, and I couldn't get past this with with any considered measures. The only approach that worked was hacking away until I got lucky. Sigma 2 rightfully got rid of this abomination, and as you'd expect, in general, it adds and subtracts in the boss department. The most egregious trash like the worm was put on the chopping board entirely, and they replaced the multiple dragons in Chapter 9, for example, with this one dragon that's more of a traditional, albeit solid, fight. There's also the new big statue boss, which is never the most compelling in concept, but I think the simplicity works well so early in the adventure. We just didn't need three variants of it in the span of like two hours is my grief there. If you ask me, not a bad set of changes though. Really, the main fights they screwed up are the ones centered around the bow. They're fundamentally botched in Sigma 2 since arrow charging as a mechanic was removed. The bosses weren't altered to accommodate this, however, and take as much damage from a normal spammable arrow shot as a fully charged shot in Vanilla 2. You can see the problem with that. Overall, it's kind of ironic and sad that one of the most enjoyable bosses for me, across both versions, was the repurposed demon guy from the first game, only now you fight him as Rachel. The minions are manageable, he himself has a moderate variety in attacks and patterns and punishes greedy players, and you cannot cheese the fight with stronger weapons, which you can do for many of Ryu's bosses, if you so choose. This was a highlight from Sigma 2 in my eyes, and Rachel sporting a firearm to integrate into combos together with her hammer, actually actually makes her stand out a little more. Credit due where credit's due. Past the above though, Sigma 2's inclusion of the three chick chapters, again, comes across as tacky and obtrusive. Listen, Momiji is one spicy senorita. I'm a fan and I'll let her Izuna drop me into the ground any day of the week. But she, as well as Ayane, just aren't that different from Ryu. Momiji has a double jump as a combo extender, I guess, and Ayane's rocking the explosive shurikens, which were taken away from Ryu and Sigma 2 specifically. I was confused about why before, but they couldn't have done that to arbitrarily give Ayane a unique selling point, could they? I hope not. Anyway, all three characters even have wall-running acrobatics, so I wonder what the point really is other than eye candy. 
I think I just answered my own question. They're plopped into previous stages with a few new sections stitched on, admittedly a slight step up from Sigma 1, and two of their three bosses Ryu encounters later on in Sigma 2, so those aren't even fully exclusive. There's also an argument to be made that Rachel segments in Sigma 1 at least have some degree of plot relevance with Elma, but besides Ayane's retrieval of the Eye of the Dragon, Momiji and Rachel are never even seen or mentioned in Vanilla 2, and their chapter here are totally random detours that interrupt the main story. Oh, right, I, I almost forgot. Ninja Gaiden 2 has a story. It's a rather shallow one. Really, it can be summed up as such. Four greater fiends are awakened, Ryu travels across the globe to put him to bed, and ultimately he confronts the successor to the Vigor Emperor, Vazda, or however you pronounce it, after a trip through hell. To an extent, you can reduce any plot like this, but I'm not really reducing it, at least not what's present in cutscenes. You see, you can actually gather quite some lore from journals. There's humorous diaries to shift through from fallen foes, fairly extensive history about the origins of the fiends, and that's admirable. Shows they had a vision for this universe. The thing is, I don't think a game like this is necessarily suited to stopping minutes on end to read paragraphs of text that contain context. Call me a lazy bum, I guess, but I feel more of this could have been incorporated into the cutscenes because the actual material therein has a little depth and no twists of any kind. It's inoffensive, it isn't bad, just a bare-bones good versus evil tale where none of the characters seem to have compelling personal stakes or motivations, if any at all, beyond that. The four greater fiends? They're forgettable. Can't sugarcoat it. Alexei is the least bland one since he is a creepy pervert to any female, including the Statue of Liberty. Trapped in a cage. Stop it. Oh yes, that's it, yes. Sing for me. Sing again. And again. But Wolf is running out of entertainment with his gladiator battles and seeks a worthy adversary. I actually got more of a laugh out of seeing all of his subordinates cheering and going apeshit. It just looks so goofy and silly. Zidonius views humans as ungrateful apes because he bestowed them with the gift of fire or whatever. And no joke, all I remember about Elizabeth, the queen of the greater fiends, is tits and cake covered in blood. Riveting stuff, truly, and it's a bummer. It's not as if Team Ninja doesn't have the ideas. Like Genshin, leader of the Black Spider Ninja Clan and essentially your equal rival, apparently hates the dragon lineage because Mirai, who used to be a part of the Hayabusa clan in the past, killed Gamov, and as it turns out, Gamov was actually Genshin's younger brother. That sounds intriguing, but the only reason I am aware of this background is because I forced myself to read all of the fucking journals for the sake of review. How is this, I assume, important part of Genshin's drive? Not integrated into the main narrative in any fashion. He doesn't even bring it up when he has a short heart-to-heart -heart with Ryu and his dying breath, which is admittedly a cool moment, with the two being able to relate to each other through their extreme dedication to protect and honor their clan. Now imagine how it could have been an even cooler moment if the Gamov detail was revealed and how that reframes Genshin in a slightly familiar light. You know, I was hoping the writers would give us more to chew on this time around, but if anything, it's less. Sure, the execution was far from stellar in Ninja Gaiden 1, however, there was the final plot twist, the whole avenging Hayabusa Village setup, and Rachel, for as superficial as she was, did have a clear empathetic reason for becoming a hunter, a reason that coincidentally gave her the shared goal with Ryu to hunt down Doku. Her replacement in 2, Sonya, might as well be a Barbie doll. The only thing I know about her is that she she works for the CIA, and I'm confident that's not on me because even her character description on the Ninja Gaiden wiki is far shorter than Rachel's. It's implied Ryu has a romantic interest in Sonya in the ending, which doesn't register for me. To him, what makes Sonya different from Rachel? There's equally little chemistry and development between the two, so is he just thirsty for some and simping? You're a Chad first class, Ryu, you don't have to stoop to this level. The man himself is still a stone face as well, though he is a bit more talkative now and I find his new actor is better. I sort of warmed up to Ryu a little here, actually. Not that his character has changed substantially, but something about his dead serious and unfazed attitude creates an amusing contrast to all the wackos and absurd circumstances he encounters. Yet your ancestors in the dragon lineage tried to extinguish that flame. Do you not think that foolish? 
I don't care. There's this event where wolves break out in Venice, tearing apart a bunch of civilians on the street, and mere seconds later, Ryu strolls around the corner, vibing like it's yet another regular day on the job as a dragon ninja. If we're not having a comedic or bold protagonist, then I can appreciate the developers showing self-awareness through what's happening around Ryu and his reaction or lack thereof. Dumb, campy shit like this and action-oriented set pieces are when the cinematics are at their most entertaining. The old blacksmith showing he still got it by single-handedly wiping out a group of black spider ninjas, Sonya blowing up an entire coliseum of fiends with helicopter missiles, her and Ryu escaping from a crashing airship on a motorcycle, and while I wish there were more of these elements, I'm glad they're there at all. The cutscenes boast some slick presentation too and hold up well with great voice acting, animation, English lips and cinematography, so at least I can wrap up my thoughts on the story on a positive note. Your embrace of the evil way has consumed you. Evil. The ninja way knows neither good nor evil. Speaking of wrapping up, we're nearing the conclusion of the video here, but first I should shoehorn in talk about the returning mission mode, because I couldn't figure out where else to do so. For Vanilla 2, it's actually DLC you have to buy, and it's a very lackluster pack. There's only 16 missions, a third of which are just fighting bosses from the campaign, but in a different setting, and much of the rest are undercooked enemy gauntlets. Many of the missions are jarringly short. There's only a small handful that are decently long and challenging, primarily the ones where you have to defeat 100 enemies, but it all feels cash grabby regardless. There are no new environments or foes or anything, it's all stuff from the main game, nothing new to see, and none of it is remixed or rethought in clever ways. This falls short of the mission modes in Black and Sigma 1, which had more content, were generally more interesting, and didn't cost any extra. Sigma 2's team missions, on the other hand, are pretty solid. They're all included in the base product for starters, and the number of missions has more than doubled, with a total of 35. These are divided into various difficulties, and from Mentor onwards, they certainly become quite hard. Ultimate Ninja is so ridiculous that you'll be fighting like three bosses simultaneously, which is brutally bullshit, but that was the intention, and I can see the value in optional bonus content that will bring even the absolute best players to their knees. Not for me, though. <laughs> On the face of it, the missions aren't much more exciting than Vanilla 2's, but the key difference is that Sigma 2's are co-op. You can play solo with an AI-controlled partner, but they constantly kick the bucket past warrior missions, so you really want to invite a buddy to get the most out of this. Local multiplayer is not supported, so I got Exo Paradigm Gamer from Ditters Everywhere fame to record some footage with me and... Oh... Oh no, this is worse than Smash Ultimates Online. Yeah, so pro tip for you zero people out there who are trying this mode on the PS3 today, make sure you're both using an Ethernet cable because it resolved nearly all the lag for us, and funnily enough, the game became more playable than Ultimates Online. How about that? It's not flawless with the input delay still, but perfectly functional. Anyway, it's pretty fun to play Ninja Gaiden together with somebody else, and there is some interactivity. If you're fast enough, you can bring each other back to life, however, the health you gain back gradually decreases, and by activating both of your Nimpos around the same time, you get this giant screen nuke that basically kills anything present at the current moment, with the exception of bosses. Naturally, bosses with minions also work now and don't feel so overwhelming, so there is a moderate amount of strategy involved there too, you know, figuring out each player's strengths and weaknesses, Another cool feature is that you can play as the babes, so you've got some choice in characters, and you bet I was a happy man when I saw two Momojis bouncing around on the battlefield together. Arr. Long story short, the team missions aren't earth-shattering, but I appreciate them for the novelty alone, and it makes me long for the ability to play through the main campaign in co-op with different characters. Sure, it would probably be broken, but with tweaks here and there, that seems like it could have been incredibly enjoyable. <laughs> Ultimately, Sigma 2 isn't some disaster. Taken by itself without context, it's a good action title for the PS3 with quite a bit of content, and it undeniably tidies up and smooths over certain aspects of Vanilla 2. For that reason, I think it's also understandable and reasonable for people to like Sigma 2 more, especially since it's very beginner-friendly. This is not a bad place to start as a Ninja Gaiden novice. By the same token, Sigma 2 makes its share of unnecessary port changes is a neutered experience overall, 
overall, and as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really come into its own with a proper sense of balance. It's one man's vision layered over the foundation of somebody else's, and so by nature, it's easy to see why Sigma 2 is so controversial. With that being said, what's perhaps most disheartening to me is that it misses the opportunity to finish what wasn't properly finished. It's well documented that Vanilla 2 had a stressful strain development, with director Tomonobu Itagaki having a fallout with the higher-ups of Koei Tecmo. This echoes through some of the lackluster to plain bad parts that crop up at various points, as well as the various glitches that can happen. Sigma 2 released 16 months later, yet it still doesn't feel super polished when it comes to weird technical hiccups, and by and large, it simply cuts out the most blatantly unfinished content. None of the weaker chapters or individual sections are rebuilt or reimagined or anything, and instead, the shiny, new exclusive content included for the campaign is fab fodder. I would have loved for Sigma 2 to stay faithful to the spirit and direction of Vanilla 2 as best as the PS3 allowed, while bringing the needed mechanical balancing and level design improvements to deliver the complete, definitive Ninja Gaiden 2 package. All things considered then, which do I prefer between Sigma 2 and Vanilla 2? Well, I can only answer with the latter simply because it's the original where the mechanics and overall design work most in tandem with each other. The game is not as tight and consistent as its predecessor. Ninja Gaiden 1 has aged like fine wine. It's the perennial classic most folks can appreciate, whereas Vanilla 2, holistically, is not as refined and meticulous. It's so uncompromising in its goal to be the most batshit insane entry in the genre despite a problematic development, that it can't help but periodically lay out the cracks bare in front of you. When I get screwed by some off-screen projectile for the 10th time on Mentor, or run into that shameless, abysmal dual armadillo fight, it's racing through my mind how rough and rushed some of the design can be. There's just no denying it. But yet, at the end of the day, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy myself a great deal as well. Don't get me wrong, I 100% wish the lows were ironed out, no apologism from me, but I do believe the highs outweigh the lows, and the highest highs are indeed high higher than Ninja Gaiden 1. The combat and feedback are in a class of their own, and all those moments when the action is coming together correctly, where you're weaving in and out of the madness surrounding you, finding chances to trim down the opposition that severely outnumbers you one by one, it is a bloody, beautiful sensation. For better or worse, Ninja Gaiden 2 is truly one of a kind, and whenever it's better, it's hard not to love. Hello, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to see more consistent uploads as a continuous viability for this channel, consider becoming a patron. It would help me out a ton and I operate on a per video basis, so you can be safe in the knowledge your money isn't going anywhere until I release new content. I appreciate you watching and listening, and peace out.